Good afternoon, Professor Nick Prokakis. Hello. Okay, let's start. Welcome to the afternoon session. For the next lecture, we have Professor Nick Prokakis. Let me give you a brief introduction. Uh, Professor Prokakis did a PhD in Northford University under supervision of Dr. Kit Burnett. He did postdoc at Institute of Electronic Structure and Laser, Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics, Duran University, and Utrecht University. Currently, he is professor of quantum physics of Newcastle University and associate director of the Joint Quantum Center. His topics of interest are BC in atomic and polariton superfluids, mixture of atomic gases, no equilibrium phenomena, and quantum turbulence, and phase transition. So please, Professor, uh, you can start. Th thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, teaching to this, in this school and to this audience. I am sorry it is happening uh, via internet and not uh, in person, but I do look forward to coming back at some point again to, to Sao Carlos. I've, I've, I've been before in one of these uh, um, summer schools and I very thoroughly enjoyed it. So the title of my talk is Quenched Phase Transition Dynamics of an Ultra-Cold Quantum Gas. And the idea of what I will be presenting is we, we've all seen pictures like the one at the bottom here, I'm not even sure where I stole this from, which is a formed Bose-Einstein condensate. And the question is, when you start from a thermal cloud to get to Bose-Einstein condensate, how does this formation process actually happen? And what are the intermediate states and what's the, the, the physics determining and uh, defining um, that? So uh, in terms of the outline of my talk, the topics I, I hope to uh, cover uh, in this lecture is, is firstly, I will give you a bit of an introduction to criticality. So what happens near the, the or at the critical point? And I will uh, review this from an equilibrium perspective and also from a dynamical perspective. So reviewing this from a dynamical perspective, I will make a connection to a well-known mechanism, which I will introduce, the kibble zurek mechanism, which talks about how things uh, grow and coherence forms, basically, when you're quenching uh, a system across a phase transition. I will then give a bit of an introduction into cold atom experiments with this. There has been a lot of experiments, but I will just uh, uh, briefly give an overview of a few of them. And then focusing on one of these experiments that was actually done at Trento, well, in a series of papers, uh, this picture is, is now sort of eight, nine years old uh, from their first experiment. I will talk about how we can understand these experiments through numerical simulations. And I will tell you what kind of a model we use uh, to do those simulations. And so what you see here is an elongated uh, condensate, well-formed condensate with loads of vortices in them, which have actually formed during the process of, uh, of growth. And then I will try to summarize uh, the key results and talk a little bit about other things also depending on how uh, time uh, is going. So the question I want to address then is basically the one up here. How does a macroscopic coherence uh, uh, form from an incoherent initial state? So we start with something which has no coherence and we end up with something that has well-formed uh, coherence or possibly is even purely superfluid. And this is a very standard and an old problem that is encountered across many different uh, branches of physics. For example, beyond atomic, molecular, and optical physics, it condensed traditionally to condensed matter and in particular quantum fluids within condensed matter. It's a statistical physics problem. And actually, interestingly, as I will explain in a minute, its origin was from uh, early cosmological studies, even though this is much more in uh, AMO and condensed matter problem uh, these days. Um, so if you would like to find out a little bit more, this review does not have all the latest results, but it has all the key issues of the problem and uh, the understanding hasn't uh, changed uh, much, even though there's been some developments uh, since. So here's my cartoon and I'll be coming back to that again later. Here's my schematic of a phase transition. On the one side here, I have a gas 
a thermal equilibrium. Okay, this is uh, now motivated from the uh, Trento experiment, which is a three-dimensional experiment, but is very highly elongated. So it's completely in the 3D regime. It's not a 1D system, but it is very elongated and it is a very, very large condensate as well. Well, very large uh, cloud. And then on the other hand, we have a well-formed condensate. Actually here, it's not completely 100% condensate, but what we're looking at is the condensate component on the other side when it's equilibrated. And obviously uh, to quench the, uh, to cross the transition, we have to cross a critical point. And so, on this axis is some kind of control parameter, which uh, could be many things, but traditionally in cold atoms, the control parameter is temperature. Okay, so we are lowering temperature as we're going from left to right. Of course, it's not as simple because in a real experiment and also the way we simulate things, the atom number is also changing in real time. Uh, but uh, um, that's just a complication to the picture. So from an equilibrium perspective, there is this critical point where things suddenly change from one side to the other. But it's not really a critical point. Obviously, as you are approaching the critical point from the incoherent region, you already start seeing uh, some, some critical uh, behavior there. So it's, it's, it's a bit, I mean, this region may not be very wide, but it's still not uh, just one point. If we now move to a different perspective, a dynamical perspective, the idea is I start with this system and I'm now cooling the system at say a constant rate. So I'm changing my control parameter, which tells me on which side of the phase transition I am. And so what happens as I do that, I kind of see, oh, well, I've just passed that critical point from how it would be from an equilibrium perspective, but nothing really happens. It takes some time for the system to react. And there's a certain time delay which will be called T hat. So this hat here signifies the time when things start happening while you're crossing the transition dynamically. And after that, you are left in a state which is highly non-equilibrium. It has all these vortices I indicated. It's a little bit like the cartoon on the top right here. We're in something like that state. And then of course that thing has got to relax and to equilibrate to its final state. And this process, uh, is uh, it, this happens through the decay of all these uh, spontaneous defects or, or vortices that form. It's, it's a phase ordering process until in the end, you have a phase coherent uh, condensate at a given temperature. And the key point is that all of these, uh, well, different stages across this process are actually characterized by universal physics. There are certain critical exponents associated with uh, criticality um, uh, and uh, uh, this new and Z and critical exponents. And depending on the type of phenomena you're, you're studying, there's certain uh, um, critical exponents and a certain universality class. And in that sense, we can connect, for example, cold atoms to liquid helium, let's say. So how does the system choose the phase as it's going through? And why is it a particular uh, uh, phase that's chosen? So let me go back to uh, Tom Kibble, who in the mid to late 70s published this paper on topology of cosmic domains and strings. Okay, I'll just show you a very small extract from there. It's actually a very interesting paper and some of the commentaries that Tom Keeble has written since even on subsequent work in condensed matter are, are, are very interesting. In that paper, he talks about the initial formation of, as he calls them, proto-domains, something like strings, for example, as the universe cools. So the idea was, he was trying to understand the formation of where we are today as the universe is cooling down. And this was on the basis of, of, of a model, which is not what we currently ascribe to really, the hot Big Bang model. So these things that I'm telling you, while they were initiated and studied actually very extensively and, and to some extent still, but not so much, in cosmology, they're no longer that relevant to cosmology uh, per se. So an extract from the paper, he says that basically we anticipate the formation of an order parameter, which varies from region to region in a more or less random way. This is kind of a cartoon picture, not from the paper. And then he says, of course, this will be somehow chaotic and will quickly uh, die away. But the interesting question is whether any residue remains of how the system has crossed the phase transition. So basically, if there's any regions 
which can be trapped like flux tubes in a superconductor or uh, uh, vortices in a superfluid. So that was the question um, that uh, Tom Kibble posed. And a few years later, uh, Wojciech Zurek came back and published this paper, Cosmological Experiments in Superfluid Helium, and brought this problem into the condensed matter realm. And uh, kibble zurek model has been in the condensed matter realm uh, since then. So um, the question he asked, uh, the paper is also very interesting, he said to discuss the analogy between cosmological strings and vortex lines in the superfluid. And then the idea was, can we actually use then superfluids to actually study something about the early universe? So that was the, the initial motivation. There were a lot of papers, a lot of work, a lot of early computer simulations done when uh, computing power was not as, as much as it is today. And then in the end, this gave rise to this well-known, which I will describe in a minute, kibble zurek mechanism. And features of these mechanisms have by now been observed in many, many diverse physical systems like uh, superfluid helium-3, helium-4, superconducting Josephson junctions, liquid crystals, ions, cold atoms, and so on. And I'll have this review on later on, but if you're interested in finding out more about the kibble zurek mechanism, this is a really excellent review, and I strongly recommend that you consult it. So let me tell you what happens then at criticality. Let's take the equilibrium, uh, consider different equilibrium configurations of the system. And what you see here, uh, this is the condensate fraction as a function of temperature. So the critical region is basically here where there's practically no condensate, where it starts forming. So as you're going from the right, so from incoherent to the critical point, it's known that the correlation length of the system is diverging. And according to the theory for critical phenomena, there's a certain way of divergence. So it diverges from this distance from the critical point, T minus Tc, with the set exponent nu, which is called the static uh, critical exponent. So this was measured uh, early on. Uh, that's going on to 15 years now. And indeed, they found the expected static critical exponent in uh, um, a cold atomic gas. On the other hand, we're talking about dynamical phenomena. So we have to think about the context of how the system reacts in time. So the context of a relaxation time. And the idea is, um, if this is the phase transition point, as the system is approaching it, um, basically the relaxation time is also diverging. So not only correlation length, but also relaxation time of the system diverges from the distance of the critical point with a related exponent, but also an additional exponent z, which is called the dynamical uh, critical exponent as well. So xi0 and t0 are actually, uh, they depend on microphysics. The interesting thing is the scaling. And these critical exponents depend on the so-called universality class of the system. So in both cases, we have this parameter t minus tc over tc, which uh, is called the distance to criticality. Obviously, when t is equal to tc, we are exactly at criticality. So let's consider how we go from something that has no chosen phase to something where it can have a whole range of different phases, but somehow the system will choose one particular direction, which will give you, give you the phase of the system. But this is randomly selected during the process. So if we have this critical driving parameter, which is our external parameter, for example, in cold atoms, the cooling parameter, let's assume, and that's what's done in the kibble zurich theory, linear uh, evolution. So this parameter, the distance from criticality varies linearly in time, uh, where t equals zero is the actual um, criticality, uh, let's say. Um, and uh, Tau Q is the rate at which it varies. Obviously, if you change Tau Q, you change how quickly or how slowly you approach. And if you look at this carefully, the parameter epsilon over its derivative actually is a time. You scale out the Tau Qs and it's just a time. So we know that there's a divergent relaxation time. Okay, I just told you that before. And this is the distance to criticality, epsilon. So this is the standard cartoon of kibble zurich uh, theory. The idea is as you're crossing from far away to the other side below the phase transition, basically the relaxation time, the response time of the system to relax diverges. 
But of course, if you're going at a finite rate, even though the system is not relaxing, at some point you will be driving the system faster than the whole system can adjust. And that's what this diagram is meant to illustrate here. So at some point, this, in this time scale, epsilon over epsilon dot, actually becomes smaller than the time for the system to adjust. And so the system is driven through, but has no time to actually adjust uh, properly. So as we start from the left, initially the system is like going through equilibrium states at the different temperatures, adjusting as a whole. But at some point, it falls out of equilibrium. As it enters the critical region, because of this divergence of the relaxation time, it undergoes this critical slowing down and it can no longer follow the behavior. So uh, what happens then when the system cannot follow the behavior is at this point, we call this point the freeze out time when basically the system can no longer continue going through equilibrium times. And in a very simple way, although it, it takes some time to get used to it, if it's the first time you hear it, the kibble Zurich condition basically says that at a certain time, which we call t hat, which is given by this epsilon or epsilon dot, the um, relaxation time at t hat, you see the relaxation time depends on time, basically. At that time, those two are equal. That's really all the kibble zurich condition or the kibble zurich equation tells you. Let's try and, and, and see what that means. We know that the relaxation time is actually given by the difference distance to criticality, but now we're talking at the critical point, at this point, t hat, where the system not falls out of equilibrium, okay? We know that epsilon is actually t, um, epsilon is t of a tau q. So we put that here, so that's t hat of a tau q. So that's uh, on the one side. On the other side, we know that t hat is epsilon over epsilon dot evaluated at that special time, t hat. So if we set those two equal, you see you have a t hat to the minus nu z here and a t hat on that side. And basically you can find a relation for t hat in terms of the rate of cooling tau q. And so what you find is the scaling of this uh, uh, time which gives you, if you like, the width of the phase transition when you're crossing dynamically in terms of uh, parameters, which are the rate of cooling and the two critical exponents for the phase transition, z and nu. And at some point there in the cartoon picture, dynamics is frozen through here, and then you come through to the other side, and then you start following again the adiabatic relaxation to go to your uh, nicely condensed state. So. We have identified what that time is, the freeze out time. And that happens at, that, at a certain distance to criticality epsilon. So I can define also the distance to criticality. Okay, just T over tau Q at T hat. The exponents and expressions don't really matter. I mean, the, the key point is how everything comes through. So why do I need to define that deviation from criticality? Well, it's to identify that point so I can connect to the equilibrium correlation length. Uh, the equilibrium correlation length, basically, we know scales as the distance to criticality to this minus nu. So I now have a dependence on this length scale at t hat, which is called uh, uh, psi hat, the, the freeze out length scale. And if I know the length scale, I know also the dimension of the system, I can figure out what the size of all domains that form that are domains of a different phase. And therefore, if I know the domains of different phase, I can actually see where uh, um, phase boundaries, so for example, topological defects, vortices, if it's a different geometry, solitons, and so on form. And that depends on the geometry of the system as well. But I can write this as a condition on the number of emerging defects in terms of the quench rate tau q, with some exponent minus alpha, which depends on, on dimensionalities and these critical exponents. The exact expressions don't matter here. The key thing is, I hope I've given you the picture, that there's these relevant scales, t hat and psi hat, and that somehow on the base of this, you can find how many defects emerge as the system is dynamically crossing the phase transition. So the main message then, if you've gotten a bit lost in the math, is that the average size of the domains in this broken symmetry phase is actually set 
by the equilibrium correlation length at the time t hat, okay, th this freeze out time. So in a cartoon picture stolen from this uh, very nice uh, cold atom experiment, but it's a standard cartoon picture, you basically have, if you quench rapidly, basically you have only neighboring um, atoms talking to each other. They choose randomly a phase. There's many vortices or, or, or defects in the regions between them. And eventually they relax to form something which is coherent. But if you go slowly, they can talk over a larger region and then you form less defects. That's basically the essence of the equations that have just been written down. So if tau Q, which tells you how long this uh, process takes from your initial thermal state to your final condensed state, how long it takes to quench through. If that is large enough, so the quench is not very fast, there's only two relevant time scales early on. That's T hat for time and Xi hat for length. So you can actually use these two scales to really look out for the scaling and look for uh, universal physics, the problem. So there's many ways of casting what Kibble Zurek uh, hypothesis or, or scaling law is. Um, so, but the essence is that everything depends on this T hat and Xi hat. So you can scale out time, distance, and uh, wave vector. You can scale them out all in terms of this T hat and Xi hat. And uh, if Kibble Zurek is right, then you will get universal behavior shortly after crossing the phase transition. So just as an example, and I know there was the talk earlier by, in the week by, by Thomas Gassenzer. He will have talked about a slightly different regime, but it's not unrelated to what is being discussed here. You, if you look at the spectral function, so the momentum distribution is basically a universal function, uh, G. The form of G doesn't matter, but it scales as T over T hat and uh, Xi hat K, okay, as you're driving the system through. So in terms of cold atoms, the first experiment was done uh, some 15 years ago. This is a simulation from the paper of that experiment um, showing uh, vortices getting trapped due to the crossing through the phase transition at a controlled rate. Uh, after that, there was very nice experiments, which I will analyze uh, in Trento um, uh, in Italy, where they had a different geometry. It was a highly elongated 3D geometry. So that is important for the nature of the defect that emerges. Then there was nice experiments in a ring trap geometry. And that was actually the geometry that was initially proposed um, uh, by Zurek. Basically the idea that phase forms randomly around the loop, a closed loop, a ring, a donut, if you like. And uh, depending on how it forms, you may be able to spontaneously get persistent currents forming. It was then analyzed in a box-like trap uh, um, uh, very nicely from where I stole this, this cartoon picture where they measured correlation functions actually and they, they, they measured critical exponents here. It was also done in a 2D trap and they saw evidence of 2D vortices uh, emerging. Um, it was done in fermionic superfluids as well. And there's many other experiments uh, um, uh, well, I'm not mentioning here, but I just wanted to give you the breadth of the kind of level of analysis that is being done uh, in, in cold atoms. So let me start with this uh, ring trap uh, thing, just because it's such a, an important one in the development of Kibble Zurich uh, theory. So the idea is um, uh, phase forms randomly around the ring. And uh, because you're going around the ring, you can think of it as going around the line. And it could be that all the phase aligns to be zero, or it could be that you form a phase winding of one plus one or minus one. So there's an angular momentum going one way or the other, or two units of angular momentum and so on. And they were able to measure that by interference experiments and to measure the winding of the phase around the angle of the, of the torus. So uh, what they found is that they have uh, supercurrents forming. And uh, if you want to have more, you get fast quenches and short hold times, but they're random events. And so the probability is picked around the zero supercurrent. And depending on how you quench, you can get uh, plus minus one, plus minus two units and, and so on. Then the other experiment in elongated 3D regime uh, spontaneous creation of these uh, Kibble Zurek solitons. Well, the idea is they had a very elongated system. You can see it here in the cartoon. So you see 
as you go from top to bottom, you form micro domains. And then the, in the region between the domains, they thought that solitons form. It turns out it's not quite a soliton, something like a hybrid between a soliton and a vortex, a so-called uh, solitonic vortex. But through expansion imaging, they actually see through this change of the aspect ratio, they see this growing in this direction. And so they see nice lines which indicate these defects from the phase transition. And what they do basically, in a nutshell, they did further control experiments. They cool at a certain rate through the, um, uh, through the phase transition at some point, and they can now image radially and axially and actually really see from different directions these defects uh, coming in in time of flight. So how would one model such experiments then? Well, let's think a bit more generally. I'm trying to give the general idea rather than all the details here. Imagine you have a physical system and you couple that system to a bath, okay? The system we know will exchange both particles and energy with the bath, but if the bath is large enough, we can assume it as remaining more or less static. The bath is equilibrating uh, much faster than the system and has more particle numbers. So the evolution then of the system will have whatever system it is, whatever characteristic Hamiltonian it is, which is of course the gross pitevsky um, evolution Hamiltonian, but it will, so H hat phi, but it will also have a dissipation term which connects to the change of particles between the system and the bath. And of course, because this is random, there will be some fluctuations associated there. And there should be some kind of generalized fluctuation dissipation theorem that relates how much uh, stuff is exchanged between system and bath with uh, the fluctuations that appear in that case. Um, so in our case, the system Hamiltonian is just a very well-known gross pitevsky Hamiltonian, okay? So here all we have is a modified gross pitevsky with basically uh, a term that can exchange particles and an associated noise. And now you might ask, what is the system? Well, if we're thinking about something in a harmonic trap, I've, I've drawn it as a cartoon version here. The system is basically all of the modes that are highly populated. So all of the modes that have occupation uh, more than of order one in them, okay? So this is not just the condensate in this case. If you like, the condensate would be sitting down here, but then there's all these modes that are, if you like, um, quasi-particle modes. There are the, it's not free particle ones. They're affected by the presence of the condensate. And if you go above this cutoff, basically you can think of them as thermal particles. So this equation is a classical field equation, and it basically models everything up to the chosen uh, cutoff. Now, because the dominant physics actually occurs in this low energy uh, part of the system here, the idea is to just model that and uh, uh, with some approximations, we can transform the earlier equation to an equation of this form. If you forget about this eta term here, this is just a, a dissipative gross pitevsky equation, which many of you have just written down uh, just uh, phenomenologically, just putting a value gamma here, and then that's just a dumped gross pitevsky equation. But this gamma is, of course, related to these the strength of the fluctuations um, eta. Okay, so we assume to, to get to that equation, we have to assume that the heat bath is static and that all the modes up to this cutoff are highly populated. But in this regime, it's sufficiently okay to say that this is what describes uh, the system. Now, the idea is when we solve this equation because of this element of stochasticity, it's, it's just a different run. So think about somebody doing an experiment. Maybe some of you or a lot of you are doing cold atom experiments. Every time you condense the system, you're doing one single run of an experiment. But in the end, you typically collect a lot of them to average out fluctuations, or if you're studying Kibble-Zurek, to count how many defects you have in each case and then average the number of defects over different runs and so on. So the idea is you do many of these and you average appropriately over them and after suitable averaging, in a statistical sense, you can go back and say, well, each numerical realization was like running the experiment one time. Okay, and so that's the idea. And we know that the strength here and uh, this gamma uh, that gives you the growth parameter are actually related to each other from, from this equation. So the external control parameters that we have are the temperature, the chemical potential, in general, the interaction strength, and uh, okay, you could also control, of course, the, the trap potential and, and so on. 
So what I will tell you a little bit about is how to model these experiments in Trento with the idea of using simulations to understand a little bit more and connect to the heart of Kibble Zurich, where it's impossible to measure very well experimentally close to the phase transition. So um, in this case, of the, I'm going to use two control parameters, the temperature and the chemical potential. So the temperature enters through the noise and the chemical potential enters in here into our sort of gross pitevsky like Hamiltonian. And the process we have is we are cooling from a large number high temperature thermal gas to a lower number condensed system with a high condensate. It's not a 100% condensate fraction, but it's about 75%. So as a cartoon, it's not the, the full physics here, but to model this reduction in atom number, I do that with a change in chemical potential. So I now have two control parameters. Temperature is being quenched from above TC to below TC, and chemical potential is being quenched from negative values to positive values in such a way that there is a point where the system is crossing criticality, and that's my TC. So I will show you a movie looking at the densities, density isosurfaces of how this thing uh, evolves. Let me just lose my um, laser pointer to see the movie. So this movie here will show you how density grows for an incoherent thermal cloud, which is this low density to something more concentrated. And yet a green is a much higher density. And you see during the quench, you get all these vortices appearing and these vortices are then trapped into the growing density and depending on uh, the intricate details of the system they can remain within the system for a very long time which is also what they found in the experiment so we'll show you some snapshots just to explain better what what you just oops what you just saw okay so we have this thermal gas around 800 nanokelvin and we try cooling it by a sort of a evaporation at the lowering temperature we cross through this critical point or this critical region, and we see that after a delay time, this T hat, we see these vortices appearing here. Okay, so these are random defects as the system is, is crossing uh, at uh, uh, um, this uh, phase transition. What you see is that gradually, as the system is cooling, you get more and more uh, condensate appearing. This is this higher density green region. Okay, it's the condensate because it's in a, a 3D elongated harmonic trap. And you can see it's very messy. Okay, you can see there's regions where it's condensate and regions where there's no condensate, and there's vortices sitting there, and there's a lot of tangled up vortices and a lot of dynamics. It's effectively turbulent, maybe not in the in the uh, ordinary way of defining turbulence. I mean, it's, a, it's in a weird geometry and everything, but it's completely chaotic and random. And then after a while, you're left with something which is more or less equilibrated, but it has a few defects trapped in. And until you get to final thermal equilibrium, you have to get rid of all of these defects. And, um, but even at long times, you might still have some defects trapped into the system, which is actually uh, what they found. So let's think about uh, this process then. If we have a very slow growth, okay, in this case, what you're seeing is the ramp takes all of these 700 milliseconds and you see we're growing very, very slowly. We're changing from the same initial to the same final temperature, but over a lot of time. So the temperature gradient is very slow. So you don't really get or see very many vortices. Something will appear at the critical point, but then nothing remains and you don't really see it. And as you go faster, you get more defects trapped and then they can stay on for a longer time. So here you see the quench finishes very early, but still after so much, so many times after the end of the quench, you still have defects trapped into the system. So in this very fast case, okay, what we have is we can see very clearly this spontaneous symmetry breaking and these uh, uh, chaotic or if you like turbulent uh, defects uh, emerging basically. And you can see that happening uh, here. These are these uh, vortices or vortex-like structures. Um, this is related to Thomas Gassenger talk who discussed about instantaneous quenches and highly non-equilibrium initial situations. And he, I think he gave an expression of that kind. I don't remember if you would have written exactly the same way about the momentum distribution. Um, but 
What they found in experiments, so the old experiments are trying to and, and, and new experiments, here's what's going on. They quench to a lower temperature and immediately upon uh, quenching down, they actually stop the quench and all the growth happens at a fixed temperature, okay? So if you quench very fast and you look at the number of defects on this axis, let me put my, my arrow again, um, sorry. If you quench the defect number as a function of quench rate here, tau q, for a fast quench, you see you never get too many, you reach a plateau, okay? Because that's given by the geometry, there's a limit to how many you can actually get. But if you go slower and slower, you see some scaling law here, which depends a little bit on the trap aspect ratio, which is what's different between these cases. So uh, the intermediate regime of these two extremes, very slow and very fast, is the regime which is relevant for testing kibble Zurich. Uh, scaling. Okay, so this sufficiently fast quench to trap the defects, but it's sufficiently slow that the growth basically occurs on the ramp, or uh, a lot of it occurs on the ramp, and then there's still some after you remove the ramp. So one way to look at the system dynamics is to look at the response by comparing equilibrium and dynamical setting, which we can do easily in the simulations. So let me explain what I'm showing here. In blue, what I'm showing is the growth of the correlation length, okay, the coherence length of the system in time as I'm quenching from above to below the transition. What is plotted in green is for each of these blue points here, uh, I have at each time, I have an input chemical potential and temperature to my dynamical code. And if I try to work out what is the equilibrium for this value of mu and T, and extract the uh, coherence length, I will find this green curve. This is showing nicely this divergence of the correlation uh, um, length as it reached criticality. And you can see here this time delay in the response of the system to start uh, growing at all. And one way to measure this is to actually look at the difference from the um, crossing the equilibrium critical point to crossing this dynamical critical point. How does the correlation function differ? So what we see is early on, the dynamics is following the equilibrium roots. So the difference between them is zero. At the very end, when the system equilibrates, the difference is zero again, because the dynamical one has equilibrated at very long times and has reached the, the equilibrium setting. But at some point, it gets maximally non-equilibrium rather rapidly and then relaxes more slowly into the system. Depending on where your ramp is, that will change, of course, the shape of this relax. These are actual data, but for one ramp, this is not a universal. The, the idea is universal, not the curve here. So initially the system is cooling quasi adiabatically, okay? Then we reach the point where the equilibrium coherence length starts diverging, okay? So at this point, we have maximal difference between the equilibrium and the dynamical one, which hasn't changed. And then it remains more or less fixed as we get some growth here starting, which is at this uh, T hat time where it's growth with vortices in the system. And then there's this gradual relaxation process, the coarsening dynamics, which is on the ramp or can also be off the ramp. Uh, and it can include entrapped defects in the route to final equilibration. So that's kind of the cartoon picture. And this is exactly what I showed you early on, this critical region, the delay in time, uh, due to kibble Zurek, and then the later relaxation time of phase ordering to the final equilibration. So to model this, we have to first extract where this critical point is. And uh, it, it's actually quite involved numerically, but uh, we've done just that to try and identify this is the, the condensate fraction as a function of uh, a, a reduced temperature. And we're showing our simulations and experimental results Okay, and we can evaluate exactly where the critical temperature is. The curves are in very good agreement with experiments. And once we know TC, we can define our distance to criticality, uh, T minus TC, okay? And we can see, for example, the condensate number starts growing there. We can see that the coherence length, that's exactly where it starts um, diverging. For example, this is all equilibrium data, but eventually it will saturate because we have a finite size system. So the idea to make connection to Kibble Zurek 
is to analyze the dynamics now that we know about which point we need to be analyzing the dynamics, okay? So we need to analyze about a time TC, lowercase tc, which is the time at which the temperature reaches the critical temperature for the given ramp rate or ramp um, uh, parameter tau q, okay? And basically there's two different things. At early times, Kibble Zurek tells us that t hat and xi hat should be the only relevant universal parameters. And at late times, the only thing that matters should be the ramp. We are far away, we, should, we, we will have a delay in the growth, but at late times, the slope and everything should evolve according to the ramp rate, which is actually driving the phase transition. And we do that by numerics and also comparing against linearized analytical solutions of the equation I showed you before, this stochastic gross pitaevsky equation. So uh, we can study a lot of things. One thing that is quite common to study is to look at sort of uh, momentum or the spectral function and look at the correlation functions that I showed you before. And we're investigating these at a time, all the time now is shifted from the point when the particular dynamical simulation uh, crosses the critical point. So T minus TC, and we are within about T hat or two T hat from that actual uh, region. So if we look at the coherence length, this is the coherence length as a function of this time. So you see all of them start after a certain delay time. Nothing is happening exactly at TC, which is here. They start later, but um, it depends on your ramp. A fast ramp will have this um, growing uh, like, like this red one, but this is very, very fast. It has trapped effects, so it looks rather messy. But if you look at the other one, slow quench to fast quench, has a, a monotonic behavior. Uh, the red one uh, is, is still a bit problematic because there's many defects trapped. Um, we can also look at the condensate mode, which we can define in this case as the K equals zero mode, just to try and understand what's going on. And what you see, if we're looking at the uh, uh, K equals zero mode as a function of time, we see the growth from a slow quench to a rapid quench being very different, okay? Everything starting a bit after this zero point of the phase transition. So the question, if Kibble Zurich is right, these things should be completely scalable out. And this is what we are doing here. Uh, we are scaling out uh, this dependence. So the Kibble Zurich hypothesis says uh, that time is scaled to um, uh, T hat, distance to Xi hat, and okay, then we have the inverse uh, uh, wave number, basically Xi hat. Okay, so I'm conscious of time, so I'm, I'm giving you key results uh, here rather than all the details. But the point is, if you look at these curves, if we just scale both axes, we are scaling both this um, F function, okay, uh, uh, the, the time with T hat, and we're also scaling this shifted time with T hat, and we're looking within about one to two T hat from the phase transition, you see all of these curves, actually scale into one. You can see the full-time evolution here, okay? But if we focus on the relevant region where Kibble Zurich should work, it's here. And we can actually make analytical predictions that it's kind of a, a Gaussian growth, which is this dashed black line here, and everything is falling in place. We can also look at the correlation length and how that is growing, which looked a lot more problematic here. And if we look at the correlation length, from the critical point up to about 1.5, 1.8 T hat, you see that all the curves completely fall onto each other in this early time regime. So this tells us that all these scalings, T hat and Xi hat work really well. And everything is consistent with the kibble Zurek model. Okay, so this is the early time evolution, if you like, to map onto kibble Zurich. But of course, this is a cartoon model. I mean, the system is a finite size system. There's a lot more going on. Um, so let me... Uh... Okay, let me tell you in summary now, because of time, what is happening in dynamics. So this slide has a lot of information, but I'm just trying to convey the picture of what happens from shortly after the phase transition until the system really equilibrates. We've seen that after the system crosses the phase transition, the defect number will decrease and the condensate density grows. So here's a picture with a high defect number at early times 
and a much reduced defect number at a later time. And these ones are very long lived now because they, they don't see each other very often to, to die away. Um, if we look at uh, cuts in the density, we can see very clearly how chaotic the system is at early times. And we can also see how the phase looks uh, very chaotic. This is in a plane here. This is a planar cut of the phase. But what we see is that while the defects are random early on, they take a very prescribed mean measure here. And, and even though there's a two pi phase winding happening around each of these, it is very concentrated in a certain region. It's not a linear two pi winding as you go around. And this is what is called the solitonic vortex. So from far away, it looks like a, a jump in the phase, which would be a soliton. But if you go very close, it looks like a vortex, but with a nonlinear change in the defect number. So, so there's evolution of the type of defect as well. And this is completely fixed, not by Kibo Zurek, but by this geometry. The defect number is decreasing as a function of the evolution time, okay, uh, past the transition. We know early on here, we have this saturation that I told you that's been seen in the experiment. If you quench any faster, there's no more space to put more vortices into the system. But also, if you run for a very long time, you have a few defects trapped into the system like here. And so uh, there's a finite number. So you, reach, you can reach another uh, plateau there. And we can look at these regimes in a simulation. We see this plateau happening, the defect number as a quench rate for very fast quench rates, we can't put many more. And we also see a power law scaling, which is consistent with the naive expectations of Kibble Zurek. There's a little bit of a question here about what exactly is the defect and the experiment measured things a bit later than our simulations. They, they had to hold it for something like 250 milliseconds before they would expand. But if we look at these late time evolutions, Hopefully you can see down here, the experiment can see from different axes and they see one defect in some simulation, in some runs, two defects, three defects, and they're not all aligned. You can see from this side here, they're not really aligned with each other. And that's exactly what we find in some of our simulations. Obviously this is just indicative. We chose here to show just like they did in the experiment, those that have one, two and three defects here. And you can see how they're randomly oriented in the different directions and how the phases are these solitonic vortex type uh, phases. Okay, so this is about how the geometry in the system changes the late time dynamics after Kibble Zurek. Now, I told you that at late time dynamics, T hat doesn't play a role. So let us go to the other end, close to the equilibration, much after T hat, okay? What we would expect is that the system will relax to the equilibrium thing, but on a shifted time scale, T minus T hat or T minus a prefactor times T hat. Okay. And this is exactly what we see here. Now what we're doing is we're taking these same curves. We're shifting them by T hat. We're actually finding that we need to shift by a non-universal factor of 1.3 in this, in this geometry, but uh, it's something of order one times T hat. Okay. We shift by that and then we scale out with tau q, the quench rate, because all the growth is now driven by the quench. And apart from the very, very fast quench rate, which we've deliberately left here to indicate what would happen if we were not in the right regime, okay? Apart from this uh, red one, which is a very rapid quench, all the others really collapse and they collapse on exactly where we would expect, the gradient we would expect from this analytical expression here. And the same happens if we look at the density wave fronts, so how the density is propagating, both in the longitudinal and in the transversal direction once we scale to their respective Thomas Fermi radii. So everything really universally falls in place at late times with the driving parameter uh, tau q. This is a different scaling to what happens close to the, the phase transition. So uh, one thing to note here, which is important, in here I'm showing the corresponding coherence length okay, scaled to the same quantity. And what you see is that for slow quenches, the time scale of growth of the coherence length in these scaled units about 0 0.7 is the same as the time scale of both the number of particles and the wavefront density, okay? They all scale the same way. But as you go to faster and faster, because you have all these defects trapped, 
they affect the coherence of the system. The system is not with a unique phase because of the defects. And you see the more rapid they are, this leads to a much longer on this time scale relaxation time for the system. So you always have to think what are the relevant parameters to scale out um, uh, the behavior to understand what's going on universally. Okay, one other thing that's very important here is to note that really everything, even though the system is inhomogeneous, is homogeneous like. So we can use this cartoon homogeneous Kibble Zurich picture and it still seems to describe the picture very well. We have done some work to understand what types of quenches would be needed to, to probe in homogeneity. And it's actually quite hard, but in this experiment, they would have needed to rather run than one second to run for at least 10 seconds or have a lot tighter confining potentials uh, or, or, or something else. Otherwise they can't really probe that. But the type of defect is actually set by the geometry and the dimensionality, okay? And that's very important. So phase ordering here is not universal. It's dominated by the type of trap that is that defines the system. So with that, uh, my time is up and I'll come to my summary of uh, what I have discussed. I hope I've given you an indication that uh, quenched quantum gases are really ideal systems for studying universal, uh, um, uh, uh, universal features. Okay, I showed you this cartoon of how the system grows through these symmetry breaking stages with all these vortices trapped in. And if you go very fast, you will end up with more vortices at a much later time than if you go slow, quasi adiabatically. So obviously if you wanna get a good condensate formed at late time, you should not go fast. That's not a good recipe. Um, so I discussed this whole process from starting from an equilibrium thermal to an equilibrium condensate here. I showed you how there's a delayed dynamics compared to the corresponding equilibrium uh, configurations and how the phase ordering pr uh, process uh, matters. And I told you about uh, critical parameters in the early time being this T hat and Xi hat. And at late times, uh, the important parameter is actually the growth. One important parameter is, is, is the ramp rate, so this tau q. So in this broad intermediate regime, kibble zurich scenario, even the simple cartoon homogeneous kibble zurich scenario was found to be applicable. I, I ho hope I've convinced you that we can indeed scale things out very nicely in terms of these parameters. And we have some other things in, in, in the paper where we've scaled things out. And I hope I've shown you that at all the times where the experiment could measure, we actually found consistent things with the experiment. And there's a few more things I didn't have time to show you, but in the more recent experiments that I think are still unpublished, they were put on the archive uh, just uh, um, late January, the, the, the way they have scaled the recent experimental data and, and things like that is consistent with the late time behavior and, and the physics that I presented here, but they could not actually probe directly T hat because that is uh, remarkably hard to do. But the defect type is set by the system geometry. Okay, so in these kinds of experiments and in all experiments that have been done to probe this with cold atoms so far, the role of the trap and density in homogeneity is just in setting the late time dynamics and the type of defect rather than deviating from the standard homogeneous kibble zurich uh, setting. So I'm not going to uh, talk uh, through all of these. I primarily want to acknowledge uh, my, uh, the person who's done all the simulations I've shown here, uh, Gary Liu, who's uh, an exceptional postdoc with whom I've been working uh, for a number of years, even through his, his PhD. Uh, but what I wanted to say is that these are universal and general features, and you can study these things in different dimensionalities and in different physical systems, and you can also study them in the presence of driving and dissipation. So in open quantum systems, we've done that, for example, in extant polariton condensates. And you can ask what is the role of driving and dissipation? What is the role of dimensionality? How are things affected when you have mixtures being quenched through the phase transition? What's the dimensionality crossover of these mixtures? What happens if you have coupled systems and, and, and they grow and different people from this uh, crowd here have contributed to um, different of these projects. So I think now here is a good time to end and to thank you all both in the room and uh, online or subsequently watching that on YouTube uh, for your attention. And I just wanna finish by leaving some references here 
the main thing I want to mention is if you want to understand a little bit about how we can model these things, there's a few uh, reviews and papers out there. If you want to understand about Kibble Zurich physics, there's two excellent reviews by Adolfo Del Campo et al. Really, really excellent. Um, Kibble is on one, Zurich is on both of these. And there's also another one which has maybe a bit more of an experimental called Atom View uh, um, by Zerom and Nier. And uh, then uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. Okay, so we are opening for question. Please, Professor. Hey, hi, Nick. How are you? Hi, Vandele. Hi, good. Thank you. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. A very broad, give us a very nice overview of uh, uh, what people are doing. I have a few basic questions just to, and then a, a, a few curiosities. Sure. Uh, what really determines the final phase that uh, the system is going to acquire? Uh, you know, uh, I was thinking that could be the first domain that's formed, could be the center of the cloud because uh, there is a more dense and so on, or could be the biggest domain. Yeah, so, so that, that's an excellent question. I'm not sure if my answer can be 100% uh, to, to the point of what you're asking, but basically what, what we see and we think is happening is, as you said, uh, growth is seeded really more where the density is highest. So we think that uh, basically growth is, is, is happening from there outwards. So, so the phase is determined, let's say, within the center of the condensate initially. So in every single realization, every single experimental run you will do, it will be different random domains and phases forming. So if you look at different uh, runs, if you were to average over all of them, and we can do that numerically, you will not find a prevalent phase. In every single run, we will have one particular phase dominating at late times from the early time dynamics. No, now, I know, but, but uh, where where that is determined. I know it could be the yes. first the domain that's formed or the biggest. No, I, I, I think domains form within, within the same. like this. Yeah, so, so within the initial, I mean, the, the cartoon picture we have is at the center of the trap, for example, it, it's, it's like homogeneous. So there's a whole region where domains form simultaneously. So it's not just one domain, there's many domains and they're random and they, and they um, interact quite a lot. And so, um, basically what happens is if, if, if I go to the analogy with the sort of uh, uh, spins like arrows, you know, there's many different arrows and basically randomly what's going to happen is a few arrows nearby are going to have point in the same direction. So a few atoms nearby will start having the same random phase and then that phase will dominate and win over sort of all the others. And that's how I understand sort of the, the phase forming uh, long term. Okay. Now, uh, just for my imagination, how a phase dissolves? Because we know that from nucleation of phases, normally you have uh, domains that dissolve and domains that are formed. This is regular nucleation of a new phase uh, type of physics. Uh, now, just uh, speaking about the phase that uh, is, is the main object that you are dealing with, how can I imagine a phase being dissolved in a domain so a new phase can be incorporated? How can I imagine? Just tell me a few yeah. words. I guess you can think of that in the region. I mean, these things form where there is basically uh, no density. So you can actually, it's, it's kind of a fluctuation. So, so you can think of it as a sort of a, a fluctuations disappearing as the system is growing. Now, uh, there are more questions. Can I go one more? You see, uh, uh, I have one more technical question, and then I have a comment uh, that may be very stupid, but uh, I don't know. This is a school you can just throw I'm sure ideas. It's not stupid, Vandele. You, you, you show in one of the parts of your talk that the temperature seems to 
relax much faster than uh, I reach the overall equilibrium with phase and everything. Is that true? I got that right or was a, a misunderstanding? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure I'm understanding. So in the simulations, the temperature is a drive parameter. So it's the temperature of the bath to which the system is coupled. I'm not measuring in any way okay. the temperature of the system, which is out of equilibrium. In the experiments, they have actually measured that. And uh, they found that for most of the ramps, except the very fast that I saw that are consistent with experimental timescale ramps, they actually measured and they found that basically they could think of it as temperature remaining more or less um, uh, constant, like ha having a well-defined temperature and temperature decreasing uh, close to linearly. But in our case, temperature is a control parameter. I could be measuring things, but we've never done that by thinking about sort of uh, the momentum of the particles and trying to extract an effective temperature, but we haven't done any of that here. Yeah, because one may think that uh, reaching a kind of a uh, uniform temperature, the system can deal with the rest of it much easier, right? Now, uh, I want to make an analogy with the laser, you know, because uh, we know that when a laser is formed, what you, you have is incorporation of, of uh, photons to a single mode with the same phase and everything. Uh, can we think about uh, an equivalent mechanism of a phase scattering such that I can start to bring part of my sample to kind of grow the phase domain? Sure, absolutely. And, and sort of going back to the first experiments, thanks for that, of, of, of Ketely, for example. I mean, the idea was initially somehow some kind of uh, uh, phase initially uh, forms and then everything is accumulating there. So you can think of it as some kind of initial spontaneous formation, like, uh, you know, like with the analogy, spontaneous emission followed by stimulated emission, stimulated scattering into that mode. So I guess this is what you were uh, aiming at, right? Yeah, because, uh, well, okay, fine. Uh, I think I, 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 I had enough. Uh, thank you very much, Nikki. I hope uh, you can come to Sao Carlos and... Uh, you know, there are so many again. things to, to be thinking about doing the lab and everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. More questions? Uh, I have a question. Uh, at the very beginning, you mentioned the bot straps. Uh, so I'm curious about the, the critical exponent, how how they are modified from the bot's potential to the harmonic potential. Right. So, um, yeah, so I, I can't give you an, an immediate answer on things. Yes, they are different um, uh, things. So, but basically there is a kind of, uh, let's say, the non-interact, the, uh, the simple, uh, ginsburg landau critical exponents and this critical exponents that include also uh, quantum fluctuations and their corrections. And it's very hard to, to measure across these. So the physics that we discussed here, even though it is a trap, actually we use homogeneous effects to model that. And so uh, one of the, the key questions uh, to try and, and, and understand is how in the dynamical setting, if that's what you were asking about dynamics, how in the dynamical setting, we can actually probe things that are related to the inhomogeneity because at the moment, dynamically, what we can probe is, is largely uh, homogeneous things. But when you look at things like, for example, the number of defects that form and the scaling of the number of defects, that is affected very much by the geometry and the dimensionality of the system. And so there, the critical exponents, uh, well, not the critical exponents, the exponents defining the number of defects that form uh, change quite a lot from the geometry. And, and uh, you can work those out uh, directly and, and, and they're well known. And uh, the, the experiment in the box trap from, from Haji Babich's group did uh, a fantastic job. What they did is they used correlation functions to measure uh, the exponent, but they had to rely on assuming one exponent, I think it was they, they relied on assuming the static exponent is the exponent that's expected, okay, similar to what was measured, say, from, from Esslinger's group, to then use the correlation functions to obtain from that the dynamical critical exponent. 
Okay, thank you. More questions? If there are no more questions, let's thanks again to Nick, please. Th thank you very much. It's a pleasure. So thank you, Nick, for the great lecture. <laughs>